Wiley. Today, I'm going to talk about why a psychologist should never see someone his patient knows. Now, that might seem obvious to most people, but every single psychologist that I've been to doesn't know the obvious. That's why I want to come on here and I want to point out why this is imperative that you never see anyone your patient knows. Not their friends, not their spouse, not their siblings, not their parents. You shouldn't take on anyone your patient knows as another patient and especially not an unethical psychologist that's having sex and physically verbally emotionally and sexually abusing your patient I mean duh <laughs> this is like one of those duh moments like really but I have to make a video because more than one psychologist did that. Two psychologists did that. So in other words, there was Dr. Richard Geis and there was Dr. Jeffrey Fortke, I was seeing. I was their patient. And I was also Dr. James Barbaria's patient. So now I had three psychologists. Actually, I had four because it was Dr. Eugene Pagani. But I don't want to complicate your life <laughs> any further. So just follow me. Now, I was dating and having a sexual relationship with Dr. James Barbaria for two solid years. He ended the, the sexual relationship began when I was his patient. He called me in his office one night and he put his tongue in my mouth when I was still his patient. And then we abruptly ended therapy just to pursue a sexual relationship, with his, which is unethical. In the book, they say you have to wait two years with zero contact. You cannot end treatment to have a sexual relationship. You have to wait two years with no contact. We didn't wait two friggin' minutes, dear. Anyway, that's an unethical relationship. Now, Dr. Jeffrey Fortgang and Dr. Richard Geis let me bring Jim, Dr. James Barberi, the unethical psychologist, into my therapy with them. So now there's two of my psychologists in the room. I did a whole video on this, but what I'm trying to say is when you do that, you jeopardize and harm your primary patient. So think I'll give you another example. Say that me and my husband go for marriage counseling with um this psychologist and then I say I want to see you alone as my own psychologist uh, aside from doing the marriage counseling now if he does that then my husband can think he's taking my side because he's seeing me alone okay and in divorce proceedings and everything this can get really really messy very fast okay because I could be telling him things privately that I'm keeping from my husband and he can't say anything when we both come in for couples therapy because his hands are tied because he has to keep confidentiality so I could be going to him and saying you know oh you know I'm having an affair with three or four guys um, I might have you know AIDS I don't know what I have um, and he can't say anything to my husband because he can't break the confidentiality he has with me as a solo patient. So this is the setup that happened with me and Jim. When we both went for couples therapy and Jim saw Dick as his patient, as he was Dick's patient and I was Dick's patient, guess what happened? No matter what I said 
Well, no matter what Jim said, Dick had to hold all that information and not let anyone know anything. Must be kind of fun, huh? To be privy to all that <laughs> and sit there, you know, smiling and going, uh-huh, and knowing what the other person, because Jim lied, you know? He could be saying, I, she, she's this, she's that, I can't stomach her, I want to end it with her, she's a, you know, rhymes with runt and all this stuff. And Dick got to pretend that he's the sweetest thing, you know, since, I don't know, apple pie, a la mode, gelato. You see what I'm saying? He can't say anything. So the psychologist should never, ever set themselves up in that kind of situation. I always say two is company, three is a crowd, even with friendships right say you have a group of friends three friends now I don't like that situ situation at all because if I'm friends with Mary and Jane and then I talk about Mary um, to Jane behind her back you know it's gonna seem like you get in a you get into like so much, you know, um, like, like garbage when you, when you set up a situation like that, you know, because then what does, you know, one friend say, you know, to the other one was like, gee, she said this and this, should I tell that friend what she's saying behind her back or, you know, will that friend get angry at me if I break the confidentiality, but she's like saying bad things around town about her. So, you know, who are you loyal to? Where does your loyalty stand? You see what I'm saying? Where does your loyalty stand? And when you get in a situation, you know, with a triangle, it's called a triangle. It's not just for lovers that lovers get into triangles, okay? A triangle is bad news, baby, bad, okay? Because you get into big messes you leave wounded hearts on the floor and it's just where do your loyalty stand it's very confusing because okay for Dick uh, where does his loyalty stand I was his patient for 16 years you know and now he's taken on an unethical psychologist who's you know violating the ethical code he should be reporting him but now he's taking him on as his patient and he's seeing us both for couples therapy. So who, where does his loyalty stand? Whose side is he on? Well, obviously he was on Jim's side because he tried to talk me into not reporting Jim to the board. Now a psychologist should never tell a patient what they should or shouldn't do, right? That's wrong. And obviously he's standing up for Jim because he's telling me you cannot report him to the board, although I did. You'll ruin his life. Where's his loyalty stand? I was his patient of 16 years. Jim came along, he was violating the ethical codes and Dick knows this. Dr. Geist knows this because he's a senior psychologist who, who took the Hippocratic Oath himself who has to abide by it himself. So he already knows this. And he's supporting someone who's violating the code, who was getting his license suspended, but he conveniently died before it. How do you like that? He just conveniently died, so he would die a hero. That really irks me, you know? It really irks me that he died a hero. All of his patients think He's a hero. All of his colleagues think he's a hero. And all of his friends think he's a hero because he never got his license suspended. Why? Because he died. He died before that could happen. But Dick is very much alive. That's why, in order for me to heal, I need to reveal. See, I'm a poet. 
and I know it. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to keep quiet anymore about these unethical psychologists. That's why I have a whole newsletter out on LinkedIn. Every day I write, I've written books upon books. I spent hours and days, weeks and months and years writing these books. You think it's easy to write a book and get it published? Even self-published. I have to do all the writing, all the editing, all the formatting, all the marketing. I have like a full-time job, but no one believes me. It's a lot of work. How many people do you know have written a book? Okay? So that, you know, that explains it. I need, I want to get, it's my mission to get the word out. You'll, no, you'll notice that a lot of people who suffer trauma in their lives write books. And I'm not talking about people who were writers before, you know. They were not, they weren't professional writers. Like, look at Natalie Holloway's mother. She makes speeches. She's written books about what happened to her daughter. She wasn't a professional writer. But because she suffered trauma of losing her, her child, she wrote books and she's in, she gives speeches to inform people. Don't be very careful about the people you get involved with. One wrong decision, like that night, Natalie getting in the car with, with Van Huren, that, oh, by the way, he's coming to the USA. Um, her making that wrong decision ended her life, and it ruined the lives of a lot of people who loved her, especially her parents. You know, I just can't imagine, you know, my child being horrifically murdered like that. Um, my life would be over for sure, you know. But I guess I'm going off topic again like I always do. But if you are a psychologist or you are a patient, make sure that your psychologist is not seeing anyone you know. Or if you're a psychologist, make sure that you don't take on, as a patient, anyone your current patient knows. Because it will just end up disastrous, believe me. Someone's going to feel hurt. Someone's going to feel like they're not going to be sure where your loyalty lies. And, and that's terrible. I mean, if you've been going to a psychologist for, you know, a decade and a half, over a decade and a half and you don't feel like they're on your side or they're supporting you you feel like they're on the side of someone abused you how would you feel how would you feel if your therapist is taking the side trying to help someone who's harming you all right take if you're a woman for example all my female subscribers what if you had a boyfriend that was beating you i mean literally giving you black eyes, you had to be hospital, hospitalized, hospitalized, um, really, he, he um, killed your pet, think about it, and you got rid of him, now you're going to a psychologist to help you deal with all that trauma, right, as an abused woman, and you find out that your psychologist, who's supposed to be helping you, is also seeing your former boyfriend who beat you up and killed your pet and almost killed you. How would you feel? Would you want to continue seeing? And you put so much trust in them. And then now they're, you know, favoring the person who hurt you and harmed you. What? That's a messed up, that's a messed up situation. Don't you think? How would you feel if it was you? It's caused me so much trauma. I, it led me into a spiral, spiraling, you know, abyss of alcoholism. I never had an alcohol problem before. But thankfully I'm doing better now, you know. I'm only drinking two glasses of wine. Um, but I was drinking four to five vodka drinks seven days a week. But it doesn't mean that I'm over it, even though it's been years. I'm not over the trauma. I will never go to another psychologist ever again the rest of my life. Ever. Read my books and then you will, you will know. If you've read my books, you will know why 
I will never, ever go to therapy ever again, no matter what happens to me. I just don't trust any psychologists. They're all the same. And I've had women, I've had men, I've had foreigners, I've had people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 70s, you know. I had a wide spectrum of them. I don't trust them. They usually go into this profession because they're very messed up themselves. So I just want to stress that, you know, don't get into a triangle, especially in therapy. It's no good to get into a triangle in your personal life, like having two boyfriends or cheating on your husband or, or wife or etc. Uh, triangles are bad. They're just bad. And in therapy, they're destructive. Not only are they bad, but they are destructive. They destroy trust. They, um, they just bring down the relationship. The loyalty is gone. The trust is gone. And you feel re-traumatized. Because not only are you dealing with the trauma from your unethical psychologist who's sexually abusing you verbally and physically, but now you have to deal with the trauma of your other psychologist who's supporting the psychologist who's sexually, verbally, and emotionally abusing you. So now you have no one in your corner. You're, you're totally alone. You have no one. Because the person that you were going to, well, both of them, they were both your psychologists, right? They were both of my psychologists. They were both supposed to be supporting me, protecting me, but neither one protected me. Neither one supported me. They both ganged up on me, and they hurt me immeasurably. Two of them against one patient. Actually, it was more than that because Dr. Jeffrey Fortgang was involved too in seeing Jim. So it's like, yeah. So I hope I got the message across loud and clear. Whether you're a psychologist, do not see anyone that your patient knows. Just never do it, ever. If you're a patient, if your psychologist is seeing someone that you know, get out of that and report them. Report them, get out. Because you're gonna feel doubly wounded. Not just wounded by the person who's harming you, the psychologist who's harming you, but by your current psychologist, by your primary psychologist who's supporting the abusive person. You see what I'm saying? So you're going to be double whammy. And I was triple whammy. Look at my video, Exploited by Free Psychologists, and see where I'm coming from. Read my books and see where I'm coming from. See why this is my mission to alert people about this because, you know, it's rare, it's bizarre, it probably was never even heard of, never talked about, never thought of. We gotta start changing the rules. We gotta start talking out, we gotta start making people aware of these things that, that, that happen and harm people very deeply. I am still have insomnia. I still have panic attacks. I still have post-stress disorder. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder um, I have you know I don't trust anyone um, I'm cutting back my drinking but it's taking a long it's taking many years just to get to this point where I am only drinking two glasses of wine a night um, and it's hurt me physically um, I've been sick I have GERD my GERD is acting up I'm sick every day now with very bad GERD acid reflux is horrible um, stomach pains. I mean, I'm in bad shape over this. So I just hope that um, someone listens to me and someone notices that, you know, and that my message gets out there. That's all I can ask.